Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. In this lecture, we're going to look at some of the tools that are available to do bioinformatics research. So if we start from a uh, browser and put in NCBI, the main hit that comes up is called the National Center for Biotechnology Information. So click on that, and that brings you to this website, NCBI. And this is a huge website that has lots and lots of different tools, databases. Um, really, it's an amazing website. Uh, and what we're going to use it is just to look at a couple things um, in this lec in this video. But there's really a lot you could do here, and they have really nice tutorials and other things if you're interested. So, let's say for example, as as some of you may know, I study mayflies. Let's say that I'm I'm wondering, well, what type of data has been submitted for mayflies? And so I can simply just type mayflies in this search field up here. Now notice that at this point it's going to search across all databases. I want to go ahead and do that. I could limit it at this point, but let's let's do this across all databases. So what you get is this jQuery outcome that shows you for all of the possible databases that NCBI links to. Here are the hits, so where the word mayflies hit upon something, kind of like when you do a Google search. So in PubMed, which is a biomedical literature, so this is just to get literature, there's 126 hits and so forth. And you go down through all of these different things and you see the different number of hits. Well, the one that we're going to look at is maybe we're interested in just knowing what are the number of total sequences for mayflies, DNA sequences that have been submitted through different researchers, including myself. Well, we can click on this number right here, 10,950. But we need to be careful. That number contains all submissions that contain the name mayflies in it. Now that, so that does not necessarily mean that it is mayfly DNA. And the way that um, you can clear that up, so here are the results again. Right now it's showing 1 through 20 of 10,950. But if I come over here on the right and click on tree, it now shows me the tree-like phylogenetic structure of where all of these DNA submissions are found. And so you can actually see that there's stuff here that is found outside of the mayflies. The may mayflies actually only contains 10,843. And I can click on that number. And now it brings me up just those 10,843 hits in the list. The list has now changed to 10,843. Okay. And if I wanted to, maybe I was only interested in one of the families here. And so maybe it was just the heptogeneity, right? So then I could click on heptogeneity, the, that number next to heptogeneity. And now it brings up just the heptogeneity. And you can see actually what's happening up in this search field is it's building this more complicated search. And you know, if you get good enough, you could actually learn how to write some of these more complicated searches and get right to what you're looking for. Um, so anyway, so that's that's how you could do that. You know, if you wanted to add on, you know, uh, a name of an author like my last name, then you could actually see go in and try to tease out how many mayfly sequences in the family Heptogeneity has the author Ogden contributed. You know, and you could you could te whittle this down and quickly come to numbers that you needed to do and, and search around. And I do this a lot when I'm trying to put together data sets, and so I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, what DNA data is available in the family Heptogeneity? And so I'll look through this list and look at the different genes. And if you quickly just look across here, you can see that these first few you are this genus, Epiorus latifolium, from the gene histone 3. And so the title gives you quite a bit of information. Here's a gene called 18S. Um, if we scroll down maybe a little bit further, we'll see something else. You know, it looks like a lot of this is just 18S. Um, but again, there's, there's 2,507 entries here, so we could look at it. If, if you want to look at one of these entries in, uh, in particular to see everything that it looks at, you can click on it. And now it gives me the GenBank view of this entry. So it has even more information. It has you know, the length, when it was submitted. It has that uh, phylogenetic structure, you know, where, do, where does it belong. It has actually the authors of the people who worked on this, so to uh, take them on and the journal where they published their paper of these findings. You can scroll down and there's even information about the, the gene sequence itself. Um, you know, we know again that this is the product histone 3, H3, histone 3, which are these histones that the DNA wraps around inside of the nucleus. It actually has the translated gene here. So there's the translation and then the actual genetic code, right? And, and, and so this is kind of the entry for that particular um, DNA sequence that was submitted. 
So that's one thing that I wanted to teach. Now another thing might be, let's say that you are collecting, uh, you, you, you've gone out somewhere into the environment, you've collected some DNA sequence, and you want to know what that DNA sequence belongs to. And I want to, to show this, I want to talk about a really interesting case. If, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's this um, mummy called Otzi, um, Otzi the Iceman, and this is just from Wikipedia here. And so they found this mummy in the, um, while it was still frozen in this glacier. So it was partially exposed. These German hikers found this. And so they went up, of course, and did all the studies. And it turns out this, this was buried with a lot of artifacts with uh, shoes and knives and other things. But more importantly, well, or also important was that it actually had DNA that was still good inside of it. So the cells had not been completely destroyed and the DNA was available to be sequenced. And so what they did is they went in and sequenced the DNA from lots of different parts, including the gut contents. Okay, so what um, what this window here is showing is after they did the sequencing, this is the DNA sequence of one of the little pieces of something that they found inside of the gut content. So we can actually answer a really interesting question by using a tool that I'm going to show you on NCBI. What was Otzi eating? So if I copy that DNA sequence, now I come back to my browser and we'll go back to NCBI and I'm going to start back at the very main page. So I click up in the upper left corner. So this takes me back to the starting page on NCBI. And over on the right hand side, you can see a bunch of the popular resources. The one that we're the tool that we're going to learn about is called BLAST. So if I click on BLAST, it brings me to this page. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Now there's lots of different types of BLAST. There are um, these different ones, and then there's some specialized ones. We're just going to worry about, for right now, this nucleotide blast. And so that means that I want to search a nucleotide database using a nucleotide query. And that's exactly what I copied from that document, which, were, which is um, a stretch of DNA that was sequenced from a piece of something inside of Otzi's gut. So we click on nucleotide blast, and it brings up this query form for us. So now I can simply paste in that nucleotide sequence that I copied. And I don't need to change anything else, but you could look at the rest of the, of the, the um, settings that you could change. The important thing is that right here I have on the database, I want to search all possible organisms, because I, I don't know what this is. If I knew that this was human or mouse, then I could specifically s select that database. But I don't know what this is. I want to try to figure out what it is, so I cl cl keep it on others. And then I go ahead and just push blast. So what this has done is it's taking that DNA sequence, submitting it to this website. A bunch of powerful computers now are comparing that sequence to all other known sequences. And then it gives me back the results. And so it gives me back the results in kind of the top hits to the not so top hits. But um, a lot of these are exactly the same. And so as you can see, the top hits here are coming from a, an organism called Capra ibex. In fact, the first four are all Capra ibex. Then you have another Capra, but from a different um, species. So look, what is Capra ibex? Well, to do that, I could come back and start another browser. And Capra ibex. And that brings me, you know, go to, to uh, maybe Wikipedia. And on Wikipedia, it tells me that the Capra Capra ibex is the alpine ibex. And here you know, are some pictures of this alpine ibex. So this actually makes sense because this uh, species is actually found in um, the area. It's, it's, it's uh, where it lives overlaps with where um, this mummy of Otzi was actually found. So it actually makes sense. So what, one of the things, at least, that he was eating in the last few days before he died was an ibex, an alpine ibex. One other thing that you can do is uh, do a blast search where you actually submit a nucleotide blast, or a nucleotide sequence, but you want it to be translated into a protein. So let's, let's, let's see how this would work. Um, for this one, I'm just going to type in human, 
and then RBP4, which is a, G, a protein coding gene. And so I come down to the nucleotide list. So here's the gene I'm going to look at. Homo sapiens retinal binding protein 4, so it's a gene here. And I'm going to come and I'm going to grab the uh, DNA here. Now I can actually, this kind of, as you can see, is going to add these, let, these numbers over here. If I click on FASTA, it gives me a different format of this. And you can see it just puts all of the letters right there all right together. And you can even say this is a gene because you can see the poly A tail there on the end. So I push copy, and now I'm going to come back and do a blast search. But this time I'm going to do a blast X because I want it to translate. So I paste that in and go ahead and push blast. So now it's submitting the nucleotide sequence, translating it, and then it's blasting that against all other nucleotide sequences that have also been translated. So it takes actually a little bit longer than the original search of just doing a nucleotide to nucleotide blast because of all of this translation. And the reason is, is it's translating it in each reading frame going forward and backwards. So that would be, if you remember, codons are three nucleotides long. So it's three reading frames going forward and three reading frames going backwards. So this is why it takes um, uh, a little bit longer. OK, so it, it has now appeared. and you can see it, it hit on things and of course it found what we just what we used to actually search but that would be this first one here but even if I would have you know it, it let's say that that was a brand new sequence that I didn't have you can see all of the other stuff that it is finding is retinal binding protein from you know humans and and then even from other organisms as well that are closely related to humans and when you look at the outcome of this it gives you this alignment and so the first line is the query, what we show, what we submitted. And the third line is the one from the DNA database that they had found. So that was that first one. That's the exact same one, so it was 100% the same. Um, but if we come down and look at one from, for example, Gorilla Gorilla, you can also look at this and see that it's actually really similar. So that, that gene between humans and gorillas is quite similar. If we come down and look at it with Canis lupus, which is the dog, you can see that there are some differences every once in a while. So, you know, here it was an F, and here below it's an L.